Yes, there is a theme today, church. I love you. I was hoping you'd respond. <laughs> Beloved, let us love one another. Alexa just read it to us. Because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. For God is love. Can you say that with me? God is love. And those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Don't you like love language? It's kind of hard to go wrong when you have a Sunday where you plan everything around the theme of love, do you think? Let us love one another. Sweet words, sweet sentiments. Indeed, good words, beautiful words. But sometimes extraordinarily hard to put into practice. Can I hear an amen? amen. You still got a little Methodist left in you. We all want to be loved. I don't believe there's a person in this world who doesn't want to experience love. Now, it's difficult to tell with some people, to be sure. Sometimes we wonder if it's possible to get through to a person who appears to care less about themselves or anyone else. Like, you know, corrupt drug dictators, drug lords, or somebody in our own family. Can you hear an amen? Sometimes it's hard to know. We just have to listen to the news for a few minutes, and we'll hear about people doing horrible things to each other just because they have a little bit of power, and they can. Never mind that they seem to have no love in their heart for another person. How, church, do we love them? Would they even understand and appreciate love if it were offered to them? Well, here's the good truth and also the hard truth. My Christian faith tells me that as long as there is God, and there always will be, no one is ever outside the range of God's love. Nobody. As long as there is life left in a person, it is our responsibility as followers of Jesus to try to show some kind of love to them, even if they throw our love away with contempt. They can take a whole host of things away from us, but they can never take away our choice to love, to trust, and to believe. One of my favorite authors was Viktor Frankl. He was a noted psychiatrist and was in a prisoner in a Nazi concentration camp during World War II. In his book, Man's Search for Meaning, he describes the brutal physical and psychological torture that he and his fellow prisoners received from their very sadistic captors. After years of back-breaking work in the bitter cold, with few clothes and ill-fitting shoes, with an ounce and a half of dry bread every day, and soup full of bugs. Suffering from cholera, typhus, and pneumonia, and the ever possible random chance that one of them would be singled out for the gas chambers. Most did not survive that torture. Some of the more sadistic prisoners survived by joining their prison guards as capos, inmate enforcers, and therefore received a tad more bread and soup to live a little while longer. Some went mad. Some committed suicide by running into the electrically charged fence. Many gave up and let fate take its course. A few, like Viktor Frankl, managed to survive until the end of the war. How did he do it? How did he succeed in this? Well, despite all that had been taken from him, he believed that he still had the God-given power to choose. He could not choose to leave the prison camp, but he could choose what he would think about, and how he would view other people. He chose to think about hope, that, that one day he would be free and see his loved ones again. 
He chose to think about the beauty of the flowers and the birds on the other side of the barbed wire. He chose to imagine himself once again lecturing in a room full of students about the psychology of hope and meaning. Hope kept him alive. Knowing that he had the freedom to choose kept him alive. He had good cause to be angry, and he was, but he chose not to be consumed by his anger. Now, here's a particularly poignant quote uh, from Frankel about choice. We who lived in concentration camps can remember the men who walked through the huts comforting others, giving away their last piece of bread. They may have been few in number, but they offer sufficient proof that everything can be taken from a person but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in a given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. And there were always choices to make. Every day, every hour offered the opportunity to make a decision a decision which determined whether you would or would not submit to those powers which threatened to rob you of, of your very self, your inner freedom, which determined whether or not you would become the plaything of circumstance, renouncing freedom and dignity to become molded into the form of the typical inmate. And then Frankel quotes Nietzsche, he who has a why to live can bear with almost any how. Hear that again. He who has a, I'll say those who have a why to live can bear with almost any how. As Christians, thankfully, we have a why to live. And it's right here in 1 John. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son, only son, into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that God loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Hear those words again. God sent his only son, the only child, into the world so that we might live through him. The good news is that God loves us, and in Christ, Christ has forgiven us all our sins. God loved us first and continues to reach out to us in love, and God has also given us a purpose. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. And we love because he first loved us. That is our why to live. OK, that sounds wonderful. And then John raises the stakes a bit higher. Those who say, I love God and hate their brothers and sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this. Those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. Let me ask you, is it easier to love a Nazi prison guard or every single member of your family? Anybody who knows what I mean, say amen. Sometimes that choice is difficult. Families can be hard. Church families can be hard. Sometimes a person is hurt by a member of their family, and that hurt runs deep. Sometimes we have hurt each other back and forth so many times that fixing that relationship sounds impossible. Sometimes we just have to let the relationship go unfixed. And yet John tells us in the scripture that if we are going to love God, we also have to love our brothers and sisters and aunts and cousins and parents and grandchildren. 
Now, for some of us, that may, may sound pretty easy. We've got relatively healthy families. For others of us, it may sound impossible. How can we choose to love someone, especially if they've hurt us deeply? Now, let me introduce a caveat here. If someone in your family has abused you, you do not have to put yourself in a place where you will be abused again. Someone who's, who does that to you has forfeited their right to be your family member. You may be able to forgive them someday, but that does not mean you have to place yourself or others you love in a position of danger. You have the choice not to place yourself at risk again. You can love them, even forgive them, but from a safe distance. Do you hear me? What I am speaking about are those relationships in our family, church, or community in which we want to be close to one another again, relationships with potential to be deeply meaningful for all involved. But how do we get there? If we have to love one another like God loves us really, how do we get there? Let me introduce a concept from the psychiatrist Alfred Adler. It's called acting as if. It is almost too simple to be, be believable, but it does work many, many times, acting as if. We treat one another as if our relationship is healthy. We behave as if we care about each other. What we are doing is acting, but I don't want you to see it in a negative light. Sometimes people don't think they're capable of doing something difficult like finishing school, speaking in public, winning a race, or getting a promotion. When they behave as if they are a good student, an excellent public speaker, a successful athlete, or a promoted employee, Often they defeat their negative thinking and learn to believe that they can do what they previously thought was impossible. I found this to work well for me. If I have to preach a sermon and I wake up in a bad mood, not that that ever, ever happens, I can behave as if I really want to be here and be in this pulpit. No, I didn't have a bad day this morning, but that's just one. <laughs> Lo and behold, after acting as if for a while, I discover that I really am glad to be here. In other words, to use complicated psychological language, fake it till you make it. How do we love our neighbors? How do we love our brothers and sisters and parents and children and that mean old uncle? How do we love others in our church family when we don't agree on the way forward? How do we love those who are different from us in whatever ways we see difference, in race, in sexual preference, in economic level, in their native language or whatever? How do we love this new pastor, Terry Cofiel, who doesn't look and sound quite like the previous pastor and who is soon to come and live among us? Well, think about what it would look like if you did love all those people I mentioned. And then make the choice to behave as if you actually do love them. Do what you think you would do if you truly, truly adored them with all of your heart. Fake it till you make it. But with what resources? You can choose to believe, as the Apostle Paul said, that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You can love as if Christ is living in you,
because actually Christ is living in you. Now, acting as if may not work in every situation, but I encourage you to give it a try. Love one another. Fake it till you make it. However you do it, let me place that beautiful and wondrous goal ahead of you again. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, I'm going to say we get a glimpse of God. God lives in us, and God's love is perfected in us. And it is by this we know that we live in him and he lives in us. Love one another. And if you can't do it, just fake it. You might be surprised what happens. Amen? amen. And amen.